Hello everybody and welcome to the Digital Writing and Publication course. I'm the instructor, Mark Bertels, and these YouTube lecture videos, uh, the idea of them really is to introduce the key themes and concepts we'll be looking at each week. And then we'll be using the live Zoom sessions for more discussion-based, activity-based learning to really cement those ideas and to, to put the theory into practice uh, to an extent. Um, so today, with it being the first lesson, uh, we are going to start nice and, and gently. Uh, today, we're just going to be looking at uh, the history of digital writing. Okay. Now, this is not a long history. Um, we've only had websites and, and writing online for about 30 years. Um, but since the very beginning of that uh, time, the need for written content has been ever present. Indeed, um, obviously it predates the ability to put on video, pictures, music. It really is the, the, the building blocks of our online experience. And as technology has grown more complex, um, what we consider writing and what, we, what it means to be a writer has changed dramatically. Uh, and that's what I really want to introduce this week. Uh, looking at the development of digital writing uh, and, and see how we've arrived at our current situation. Um, if we think about our daily life, um, we now produce and consume the vast majority of, of, written, of our written content um, online. Um, we don't do much physical writing anymore. Uh, we don't do much physical reading of magazines and books uh, anymore. Um, you know, we wake up in the morning, we read the news on our, on our phones, we catch up with our friends on Facebook, um, and, you know, we relax and un unwind um, reading about our favourite celebrities in the evening. So there's a vast amount of content out there and all of this has been written by somebody somewhere. Um, and what is particularly uh, unique about online content is that we create our own online world. Um, it's really amazing to think that, that no two people have the same experience on the internet um, as each other. Um, every day, we take a different path through websites, we look at different things, and no two people are gonna ever do exactly the same thing. So all this means that uh, digital writing is written in a very specific way um, to allow us to do this and to encourage us to do this. So that's what we're gonna be looking at in this course. How can we write good, attractive content for, um, the internet and what is its purpose? Who's reading it? Um, these are all questions we will be looking at in the course. But today um, we just have um, kind of two things I want to look at, um, uh, two real objectives um, I want to focus on. Today, first of all, we are going to look at the definition of what digital text is uh, or non-linear text as we will come to know it and highlight the key differences between this kind of content and other content uh, we consume in, in, in more traditional forms, uh, magazines, books, etc. And then I would also want to, to look at um, uh, how the creation of digital writing has really revolutionized, revolutionized how and from whom we receive information. OK, uh, like I said, it's not the longest history um, uh, in the world, only about 30 years, but a lot has changed in that time. So we're going to be looking at um, how we got to this point and then that will provide us with a good foundation for moving forward with the course and really looking at uh, online writing and, and uh, how it functions. OK, so uh, by way of introduction, I want to first show you a short video. Um, now, this is, is a few years old now, uh, certainly in, in technological terms, things have, have progressed. I mean, this is from uh, 2007. But I think um, the video, uh, which was created by a professor in the United States, it really highlights a lot of these key differences um, we're looking at with 
digital writing and digital text. Um, and then um, I want to explain and go into a bit more detail about some of these points um, the, the uh, video uh, touches upon. So first of all, let's watch the video and then we will go into that uh, analysis of it. Okay, so it's about five or six minutes long. So uh, just settle in uh, and please watch the video.
Okay, so um, like I say, I think that video does a really good uh, job of, of just touching on a lot of the key ideas um, we're going to be looking at in this course. Um, a lot, perhaps a new, perhaps a lot of new terms, um, new ideas in there. Um, but don't worry, we're going to be unpacking those as we go through the course. Um, today, I want to focus on on a couple of bits uh, we saw in the video. Um, first of all, this this idea of, of linear and, and non-linear text. Um, so let's look at that uh, first of all. Um, now in the video, uh, we, we saw that the, the linear text um, and non-linear text are different. Okay, um, non-linear text is our is our digital text. Okay, um, so let's look first at linear text, which is a more traditional um, kind of writing, which as we can see in the little picture in the background, we've got a, a page of, of linear text here. Um, it's the first page to a Charles Dickens novel, The Tale of Two Cities. Now, with digi digital text, um, um, it is really a text which needs to be read from beginning to end. So like the um, novel in the background here, um, when you pick up a, a book, a novel, you open it and you start at the first page. You read the first word first and you will read that information, usually in order, um, from the beginning to the end. There is... Um, um, a set order to it. Um, examples of this, of course, are novels, uh, letter, if somebody sends you a letter, uh, textbooks, newspaper articles. These are uh, very structured pieces of information, of uh, written information. And the reading path, the way we read it, is um, decided by the author. Um, the author has said, OK, I want the information to, pre to be presented in this order. And that is how you should consume it. So Charles Dickens, when writing The Tale of Two Cities in the background there, he will have thought about how he wants the story to progress. And you follow that same train of thought. OK, so you are following exactly the author's instructions in, in reading it. And um, efficiency-wise, um, it's not the best, okay? Linear text has, has been around for thousands of years and it's very good, but it's not the easiest way to find information. Um, I'm sure we've all had the experience of, of searching for something in a book, maybe something you've read once before, and you think, oh, wh where's that piece of really interesting information? I want to try and find it again. And you can't, you know, it might take you 10 minutes, 20 minutes to find that same paragraph that you read before so you can put it in your essay or or what have you. So it's it's not the easiest way. You know, it's not easily searchable. Um, um, you have, may have to flick through several pages to find your information. So uh, whilst um, it's very good, linear text has the, the, the distinct disadvantage is in that it's, it's not very efficient for the reader. You know, we have to consume a lot of information um, to be able to get down to the key information we really need. Now, when the internet came along, this kind of rewrote the rule book in, in, in how we can read a piece of written information. Um, and so this non-linear text, as it's, as it's termed, um, ha is distinctly different to uh, written information in books, in newspapers, in, in letters. Um, Nonlinear text does not necessarily need to be read from beginning to end. Okay, no, very few people have ever sat down and go right. I'm going to read a, a website from beginning to end. Okay, it's very difficult to read a website from beginning to end because there is no beginning. An end of a website. If you think about it, you, you may have a home page that you start at, but once you go beyond that home page, there's no direction from the person who's written the website. No, di no clear direction. Uh, what order you should read the pages in? Uh, should you read the about us section first? Should you read the news section first? Should you read the product section first? It's entirely up to us, the reader. So there is um, 
there are many ways to read it. Okay. Um, of course, websites are not the only kind of nonlinear text. This is something that has existed for some time. Uh, other examples would be uh, encyclopedias. You know, nobody sits down and read, reads an encyclopedia from beginning to end. Um, Flowcharts, similarly, nobody would sit down and read them from beginning to end. But really, it was the creation of the website which was the game changer that made nonlinear text really the dominant form of written information. And like we say, there are many ways to read this kind of text. Okay, uh, it's not decided by any kind of author. It's decided by us, the reader. So, like I said, for the example of a website, you're not sitting down and reading a website from start to finish because there is no start and finish to a website. We, the reader, decide where the start and finish of a website is, um, how long we want to read it for, what information we value as important. Um, so there's very little indication from the author. So the reading path, the way we read the text um, uh, can be multifaceted. Different people will approach the same body of text in a different way read it in a different order. And the good thing that this allows us, it allows us to find information much, much more quickly. Okay, A simple Google search, an internet search, a website search is far more efficient than flicking through books uh, several books at a time, maybe, to find that key piece of information. You know, that's why it's so handy, it's so useful, uh, and really has changed the way um, we, we, we interact with the written word. So that's the basic difference between the linear text that came before, more traditional ideas of writing, and then what we'll be looking at the course is this non-linear text, um, and the functions of, of this kind of writing. So that's really what we're looking at uh, in this course. So let's take a trip back now. Uh, let's look at the internet and let's let's think about the history um, of, of, of the internet. Now this is um, the internet, how it looked back in 1996. And as we can see from this from this early uh, incarnation uh, of the internet, um, there's not a great deal of text to begin with. Okay, we have very little uh, text here um, for us to go on. Um, 1996 um, uh, is the year back in the UK, uh, Prince Charles and Lady Diana um, uh, got divorced. Uh, here in Japan, DVDs were just being launched. And the number of people online at this time was around about 10 million, 10 million worldwide. Um, so, you know, that's less than the number of people living in Tokyo um, that are actually online at this point. Um, and we're looking at the Yahoo search page. You may wonder why we're not looking at Google. Um, and that's simply because Google hasn't been launched yet. Um, um, Google will not be launched until 1998. So Yahoo was the first search engine. And we can see that back in the early days of the internet, content was extremely limited. Uh, there's no newsfeed, no pictures, no up-to-date content. Um, the links were offered a, a kind of one word links or two words. Um, so let's have a look at how we might navigate this early uh, internet. So we have a list of, of, of different areas we can look at here and I can choose one. For example, I can choose to click on universities and that will bring us through uh, to this section here um, where we have a list of countries. Uh, so we can search by countries, but we do have a search box. So how about we put in Jose University into our search box and hit search. And we can come to the Jose University website back in 1996. Click on that. And well, here we are. This is how the Jose University website looked in 1996. Barely anything on it. 
Okay, in the terms of writing, there's next to nothing on here. Okay, why was there next to nothing? Okay, why is there such a little information on here? Okay, let's answer, try and answer that question. Um, it's all to do with how websites back in the early days were set up. Okay, so as you can see, we have very little writing on the internet, and that's because um, it was difficult to write on the internet. If we if we just look at the the background, the, the kind of back end of this web page, oh, wrong way, um, the back end of this web page. Look at the code. Um, this is what we would see if we were, if we were, were looking at the code of the website. Now, don't worry. This this course is not going to be about coding. Uh, we're just looking at the kind of content production, but. Just to give you an idea of how difficult it was to write on the internet back in 1996, this is how written content was produced. Um, you can see here, it is actually part of the code. It's hard coded into the website. Okay, so the problem here was, um, is that it had to be written at the time um, of the website being produced, okay? Um, so whoever was coding this website would manually have to um, put in the information into the lines of code for the information to be displayed uh, on the website. So this has uh, a few problems with it. Um, firstly, um, to be able to write anything, you need to be able to code. Okay, so to be able to, to write this information, uh, you need to be able to code. So coders were not generally writers, so the information was fairly sparse. Second problem, uh, internet speeds were slow. So the more information you had in the uh, actual code, the longer the website would take to load. So uh, you had to be brief to help loading times. And thirdly, it had to be fairly generic because we couldn't update it very often. Okay, you would have to pay the coder to go in unless you knew coding yourself. You would have to pay somebody to go in um, and update information. So it's not something you could do on a daily, weekly, or even probably monthly basis. This would be something you, you put together, you put up, and it would be a pretty static. Okay. So in the 1990s, we didn't see much writing on the internet. Um, and this is, is kind of what we call Web 1.0, the original web. And this was when it was all written in what we've just seen, which is HTML. Again, don't worry about getting too bogged down in, in the technology. We're not going to be focusing too much on that. Just gives us a nice flavour for the, in, the, um, the, uh, the history of, of websites. So with this, with this uh, HTML, there were, there were several constraints and several problems. Um, HTML was designed to define the structure of, of the uh, entire web document. So as we said just now, to be able to post written information online, you needed to be able to hard code it into the back end of the uh, system. So it was it was extremely complicated. It was very difficult um, and you needed to be multi-skilled to be able to do it. So generally um, the, the, the information was very static. It would be uploaded and remain the same for, for, for years at a time. There wasn't a great deal of movement like we see now where news feeds are updated hourly or by minute. So that was the first problem we had back in the 1990s. Um, as it became more complex, we got uh, more elements. Uh, style started was the first time for the first time uh, was possible. Uh, being able to do things in, it, in italics and bold um, would again need to be hard coded in there. But we got the beginnings of style as, as HTML developed and we could do a few things. We could change color, we could change the italic, we could change bold. And we had a, a certain uh, number of fonts that we could use um, when creating a website. 
Um, and all this kind of defined and limited to uh, how written com content, content could be formatted. So it really was extremely limited. Um, there wasn't a great deal that could be done with the, the internet um, because form and content were inseparable. The, to be able to change any kind of content, you had to go in and change the formatting of the website physically to do that. So back in the 1990s, um, the internet was an extremely boring place. Um, and for, for many years, it, it was largely ignored. Uh, um, this kind of was a space for, for uh, geeks uh, and computer programmers. Um, it wasn't really a place where you would spend any of your leisure time. Um, you might go on for specific information for the novelty of being able to, to browse something online, but not really for any of the purposes we use it now. Now that all changed round about the uh, turn of the millennium, uh, and that was driven largely um, by a change in the coding, uh, the way websites were coded. Uh, and this is when uh, something called XML came in uh, and the uh, it kind of has a loose term, Web 2.0. So the kind of uh, reimagining of the web, if you like. Now, this had a real big impact on what we could do with written content and indeed other kinds of content online. Um, it meant that um, simply um, that form and content were separated. OK, so. With XML, you could have content and form separate. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Here's an example of, of, of HTML and X, XTML, uh, sorry, HTML and XML. Um, as we said before, HTML, everything had to be hard coded. Um, um, you can see there in the little uh, top right hand corner box, um, to have the name Maria Roberts, you would need to define the font size, the font color, um, you put in italics, bold, that kind of thing. Whereas XML, it was more like um, unpacking the information and saying this is the content, but it's not with form. OK, there's no um, formatting constra uh, constraints on this. And that meant that any kind of written data could be exported um, free from formatted constraints. So information could be moved across websites and could be um, seen in different forms. And we saw this in the video um, as, as he kind of showed um, the different uh, blogs that he was following, the anthropology blogs. He had an, uh, an RSS feed uh, where he was getting all this up to the minute content um, but it was formatted very differently to the actual website when you go and click on the link. OK, and that's something we kind of take for granted now. Um, but in the uh, around about the 2000s, this was revolutionary. OK, um, form and content were separated. And um, the big game changer here was that because form and content were separated, you no longer needed to know how to code to upload content to the web. OK, this is where um, we finally had the ability um, to to use the web as we know it now. So the example that we had in the video was was we saw very briefly he created uh, his own blog um, and that's something that we can do um, to this day. Um, for example, here, uh, here is the, the blogger website um, and it takes two minutes to create a blog. OK, uh, you can see there we have a title bar. Uh, we put the title in. We have an address bar. We put the address in, create a, a, a web address. We then choose a theme. These are all things we're used to doing. Um, uh, but this was you know, revolutionary 20 years ago. The fact you could do this. Um, just put in the title, create an address, choose a basic theme, click create blog, and voila, you have a blog. And the information is, is, is up there. Um, and it's not, uh, there's no kind of formatting constraints. 
So if you wanted, for example, to go in and change that theme we looked at just a moment ago, you can do it. Okay, it's very easy. Um, same content, okay, same content as we had before, but it's been um, rejigged. We've got a different picture, we've got different colors, different formatting, different fonts, and all that's been done without us having to do any coding. Okay, that's the experience we have now. And because suddenly um, you didn't need to code, that meant suddenly a lot of people took a lot more interest in the internet. Okay, um, and it became not just a place for 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 kind of a computer um, engineers and, 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 and software geeks. This was a place where um, anybody could upload something. Um, really, it was an explosion in people uh, creating things. Uh, you know, around about the 2000s, everybody had a blog. Everybody want, suddenly wanted to, to tell the world their story or, or tell the world about their dog or, or whatever their interest was. Um, and as we now know, um, as technology developed, you know, we're not limited to just writing, okay? We can now incorporate pictures, video, um, all sorts of other aesthetic elements into um, our written work. So this was the game changer. This was really the start of the web as we know it, it now. Um, and people being able to uh, experience the web in this way really meant that we had a huge uh, sea change of, of people using it uh, and the popularity ballooned. Um, so really that is what we are going to be um, looking at in the course. We're going to be looking at, at, at all these points about um, about how um, we can, you know, how form and content have a kind of interplay now. Um, Writing is not just writing, it's, it's an interplay of writing and images, writing and uh, video. And um, we're going to be looking at the fact that, that, that people uh, are writing for a different purpose. We're going to be looking at audiences, um, we're going to be looking at um, uh, the ways in which we can uh, get people to read it, why people read, and then ultimately um, um, the goal of that writing. So that just gives us a, a little bit of an overview of where we came from um, and, and where we are now. Uh, as I say, over the next few weeks, we'll be looking at, um, starting out looking at the basic principles for good writing uh, next week in, in the video section. And then we'll move forward with looking at content production, looking at who the audience is, what our purpose is, and uh, what the purpose of the website or writing is. Um, so all that's to come. I hope this has been a, a, a kind of good introductory uh, half hour. Um, we will continue on with the activities uh, detailed on Hoppy and Zoom. But for now, uh, I will see you back in the classroom. So for now, goodbye. <laughs>